Hi, everyone. Thanks for making it out. Uh, it's a drizzly, chilly morning, um, but it looks like just about everyone made it. My name is Ruben, uh, and I'll be leading the workshop today. Uh, so the topic is using functional programming for efficient data processing and analysis. So let's just jump right into this. Okay, so first I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I'm the managing director of Nerevu Development. Uh, Nerevu Development is a data analytics consulting firm. I'm also the founder of a meetup uh, called Arusha Coders. So I'm uh, from the US and Illinois. Uh, I've been living in Tanzania uh, for the past 10 years, uh, and specifically in Arusha. And for those that don't know, Tanzania is on the eastern part of Africa. Uh, and so after the first few years I was there, I kind of um, felt like I was the only programmer. And I traveled to Nairobi quite a bit, and they have a really active um, developer community, lots of meetups, um, lots of events. They didn't really have that in Arusha. And so I kind of started a meetup of my own called Arusha Coders. Um, and we've been around for the past three years. Um, we have regular meetups. Uh, and it's a mix of developers, designers, and people interested in technology. I'm also the author of several uh, popular Python packages. So we'll be talking about two of those today. Um, so the first is Meza, which is a data processing library. And the second is Rico, which is a stream processing library. OK, so just to kind of set expectations. So this is meant to be a hands-on workshop. So expect to kind of get your hands dirty. Um, so hopefully, uh, if you don't now, you, you, you'll still have some time. Um, you should have Python 3 on your laptop. Um, so I hope everyone here ha has Python. Uh, and also, you'll be using pip. Um, so there will be two or three packages that we're going to install. Uh, and they're all available. And so it's going to kind of be a mix. There will be some lecture. Uh, and then there's going to be some examples. Uh, and they're just going to be interspersed um, throughout. But if, if you get confused or something doesn't make sense, just raise your hand and um, you know, I'm feel free to interrupt, so it's fine. Okay, first I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what data is, or at least the way that I see it. Uh, so I kind of like to break it out um, by the way it's organized. Uh, and so generally you can break it out into either structured data or unstructured data. Um, structured data is something that you can present in a tabular view. Um, so this is just kind of a table, um, a few rooms, uh, and uh, for tutorials that are happening right now, uh, and then the presenters um, for each tutorial. And then unstructured data isn't something that's in a tabular form. So usually it's just kind of raw text, uh, and this is kind of the text of the description for um, another one of the tu tutorials that's happening. The second way I like to look at it is how the data is stored. And so you can generally store data either as a flat file or a binary file. Um, and flat files you're probably all familiar with. Um, so this is just an, uh, an example of a CSV. So with a flat file, if you open it with a text editor, you can see the text. Um, the text that you see is, is the actual um, data the way it's represented. Um, binary data, however, isn't stored as text. So if you open um, a binary file with a text editor, you won't actually see um, the way it's kind of meant to be represented. What you'll see is just kind of um, you know, the hexadecimal numbers that represent the data. And then when you kind of combine those, you get this kind of two by two matrix. So if we just look at structured binary data, um, this is something like SQLite, um, also Microsoft Excel, um, if you have structured flat data, so you have things like CSV, XML, JSON. Um, unstructured flat data um, are usually just text files. Uh, it could also be Markdown, um, RST. And then finally, unstructured binary. So these are things like uh, Microsoft Word, um, maybe even PowerPoint. Uh, for the most part, we're going to be dealing with that, um, that upper row. So Mainly, we're dealing with structured data, so data that can be represented tabularly. And then I'll show you examples for how you can um, read and write both uh, flat and binary. OK, so now we're going to go a little bit into about actually processing the data. Uh, so who, who here is familiar with, with ETL, Extract Transform Load? OK, just about everybody. That's good. OK, so just for those 
for the few that aren't, um, just a quick visual. So extracting is just taking data from different sources um, and kind of putting it into a form that Python can work with. Um, transforming is taking the data and kind of going from one form to another. And in this example, this was just a filter. So it took um, two of the data points and then dropped the middle data point. And then loading is taking the data out of Python and kind of putting it back um, into uh, something that you can save on disk. So it could be um, a CSV file, it could be an Excel file, it could even be loading it into a database. Um, essentially, just, it's just getting it out of Python. Okay, so now we're going to get a little bit into functional programming. Uh, and first, before we actually get into that, I'm going to show you an example using um, imperative object-oriented and then show you how you do things a little differently um, if you were doing it functionally. Uh, and so in this case, we're just going to be doing something simple. We're going to have a rectangle. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, with this. This is just kind of a basic class. Uh, in this case, it's a, a class that makes a rectangle. Um, so you kind of provide it with the length and width of the rectangle. Um, it has a property that gives you the area of the rectangle. And then it has a method um, that grows the rectangle. And so the way that you would use it, uh, so in the first case, we're just um, creating an object R, and we're giving it um, a length and width of, of 2 and 3. And so when you call the property for length, then you get 2. When you call the property for area, you get 6. Uh, and then in the middle there, we're going to do something. We're just going to grow the rectangle by 2. So now when we call the length, we get 4. And when we call the area, you get 12. And so one of the things that you can run into is that you can see in the case that we're calling length and area, we're calling the same method, um, but we're getting a different result um, the second time we call it. And that's because the grow method um, changed the properties of the rectangle. Um, so when you have a class uh, and you call a method on it, um, that method can change any of the properties um, of that class. So when you wind up trying to call an attribute, it may have changed uh, from the last time that you called it. Um, so that's one of the, the major uh, kind of downfalls of, of object-oriented programming is because that means you have to really look at every method in the class and see if there's any method that's going to change any attribute that you might be relying on. Okay, so now we're going to get into kind of another disadvantage. So this time we're going to change... Um, one thing, so we're going to subclass the rectangle, and we're going to have an expensive rectangle. So this one, all it's doing is it's just going to sleep um, before giving you the area. And this is just um, kind of a fill-in to represent anything that might be computationally intensive. Um, so you might be doing some, uh, some numerical process or some kind of um, series of steps that just happen to take a long time. So in this case, we're just going to be sleeping for five seconds. And so now when you call it, so we get the rectangle, and now we want to call the area. Uh, and you know, in this case, you're going to have to wait five seconds, and then you get the result. So let's say you're doing some calculations, and then you need the area again. So you call it. OK, now you have to wait, 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 wait five seconds, and then you finally get it. Um, so essentially, every time you call that attribute, um, it, could, it could also be a method, but every time you call it, you have to pay the price um, that, of that expensive computation each time. Okay, so now we're going to get into one more downfall. Uh, in this case, uh, we're going to be using um, a series um, of rectangles. And just to make it easier, we're going to be using squares, uh, but we're going to use an infinite list of squares. Uh, and once we have that list of squares, um, this function is just going to calculate the sum of the area of all those. And so it's um, pretty um, simple. Uh, this is probably what a lot of people have done before. So you just kind of create uh, a variable that stores the total, and then you iterate through each, each rectangle, and you add um, the new area. And then finally, you return it. OK, so in order to create the, the input, so we're going to be using a module called iterTools. 
so iter tools is something that's really useful for functional programming. They have a ton of module, sorry, a ton of functions um, that do some pretty cool things. Um, so in this case, we're using count. And count um, just starts from the number that you give it, uh, and then it just increments by one, and it just does that infinitely. Uh, and so in this case, um, we're going to create uh, something that's called a generator. So that's um, where you see squares. Uh, since we're using, I'll just point it out here, since we're using parentheses uh, in the beginning and the end, um, what that does is it creates a generator object. Um, so then when you actually call squares, um, you don't have a list. You have kind of a, a, a lazy um, reference to the list. And in order to get each item from that, you call the next function. Uh, and so you can see in this case, we have that rectangle object. Uh, and so kind of all we're doing here, we're creating an infinite list of, of rectangles. Um, so it's going to be a square. So the first one's going to be a one by one square, then two by two, three by three, et cetera. So now if we want to calculate the sum um, of the area of the squares, um, so we call it, uh, and you're just going to be waiting and waiting and waiting, and you're actually going to be waiting forever because, you know, it doesn't end. Um, so you have to kind of do control C, um, you know, get rid of uh, the computation um, because you're going to run out of memory eventually. Um, and so that's kind of another downfall of object-oriented programming is that if you have like an infinite list or maybe the list um, of objects is just so big that it won't fit into memory, using kind of object-oriented programming, it doesn't give you kind of nice ways to deal with that. Okay, so next we're going to kind of look at those same examples, but just show you how we, you would use functional programming to do things a bit differently. Um, so in this case, instead of having a class, um, we just have multiple functions. So we have a function called make rectangle. Um, it takes the same arguments, length and width, um, and then it returns a tuple. Uh, and then we have a function grow rectangle. So it takes a rectangle uh, as an input and then the amount that you want to grow it by. And in this case, it's returning another rectangle. And then as before, there's the length and area. Um, but in this case, instead of attributes, they're just going to be functions. And so the way you use it is kind of similar as before. Um, so you, you get R, which represents your rectangle. Um, but this time, we're taking the rectangle and we're passing it into the function. So we pass it into the function, get length, and we get two. We pass the rectangle into the function, get area, and we get six. Uh, and then when we want to grow the rectangle, um, again, we pass it into the function, and we get a new rectangle. And you can see here, if we call get length and get area, we have the same result that we got before. So in this case, um, just by using functional programming, it means you don't have to kind of worry about all the functions that exist because you know that each function takes in your object and returns something new. And you're not changing something about the object that you give it. So if somebody adds a new function, you don't have to kind of look at the details. Um, all you have to really look at is the function that you're calling. So it makes things a lot simpler to maintain. Um, and you can also organize things a little better because they don't really have to be, um, each function doesn't have to be together um, because they kind of act independently. And so now, since the grow rectangle was actually returning something new, um, I'm just showing you how you would use it. So in this case, we're saving um, the result of the grow rectangle into a new variable, and we're just going to call it big R. And so now when we use get length and get area on that new rectangle, we can get um, the, the doubled length and the doubled area. So in this case, the main difference is you're essentially going to be um, setting new variables each time you kind of make a change. So if you want to save, um, if you want to grow something or if you want to make some kind of modification, instead of doing it directly on that object, you just create a new object and then you save that. So now that we've done this, um, looking at the example of the expensive rectangle, so we can do some interesting things. Since we're having functions, uh, one of the properties of these functions is that when you give it the same input, it always returns the same output. So if you have something like that, what you can do is you can do something called memoization. And so in Python, there's a pretty neat function 
Uh, so from Funk Tools, it's called LRU Cache, and it's just the uh, least recently used cache. Um, so what that means is it keeps track of every argument that you give it, um, and then there's a finite set of memory that it takes up, and then the one that was least recently used is the, is the item that kind of gets deleted when it's running out of space. Um, so we just take that operator um, and we put it, uh, sorry, the decorator, and we put the decorator um, on top of the function. And essentially what that means is the first time we call it with the same kind of value, then we have to pay the price. But every subsequent time after that, the value is kind of saved in memory. And so I'll just show you how that works. So here we, we make a rectangle. We're going to call this expensive get area. So the first time you have to wait five seconds, and then you get the result. But the next time you call it, you get the result back immediately. Um, so you can wind up kind of saving a lot of time. Um, if you're dealing with any kind of work where you're, you kind of have a limited set of inputs, um, and those inputs are kind of being used multiple times, then using the minimization can really help speed things up. Okay, so now this is going to show you how you would uh, handle the case of, of having the, the infinite list. Um, so in this case, we're going to use what's called an accumulator. So you give it your, your list or your iterator of rectangles, and instead of kind of waiting until the entire list has been exhausted and then returning, um, it kind of yields. And when you have a function that has a yield instead of a return, then that makes that, it turns that function into a generator. And so this is kind of one of the, the key pieces of, of functional programming, is you'll see a lot of that. Um, you'll see a lot of generators, um, and you'll see yields, and you'll see parentheses instead of the square brackets. Uh, and so what that means is, Every time you use the function next, um, it returns kind of what is after that yield. And I'll, I'll show you how you would use that. And so in this case, um, there's a, another function I'm going to introduce from iterTools. It's called iSlice. And so iSlice um, works for just getting a piece of, uh, of a generator. So the, in the case of a list where you would use square brackets, to kind of um, take a slice of the list. For a generator, you use I slice. Uh, and so they're kind of similar things. So first, we um, use uh, the generator to get the, the infinite list of squares. And so it's kind of the same as before. We are using count. So we have um, you know, one by one square, two by two, three by three, et cetera. Uh, and now we're going to set the area to be equal to the function accumulate area. And then we give it the infinite list of squares. Uh, and then we're going to use I slice. So in this case, um, I want to see the sum of the first six squares. And so when we pass that um, into next, then we can see that it's 140. Uh, and then every time we call next, call the function next on that, you know, on that area generator, it's going to take the next square and then add the area to the sum. And so this is a really efficient way to kind of deal with something that may be infinite in size or just very large in size. And so you only have to deal with the you know, amount of data that you need right now. The rest of the data, if you don't need it, then it doesn't get computed. You're not going to take up processing time. Or if you know, it happens to be making um, web requests, you don't have to deal with any of that. And there's. Also, another thing you can do, so iterTools has a function um, called accumulate um, that kind of does that for you. So in this case, and I'll just kind of switch it back and forth so you can see the difference. So you can see here that the main difference is we're not going to use our accumulate area function that we made. We're going to be using the built-in one from iterTools. And then the way accumulate works is you pass in the function that's going to be doing the accumulation. So in this case, it's get area. Um, and then you kind of give it the argument. So we're doing the same thing, but we're just kind of using, we're using the built-in um, iter tools accumulate function. Um, and you can see that the result um, winds up being the same thing. 
Okay, so I'm going to stop there. So there's uh, an exercise next, but let me just stop there and see if there's any questions um, on, on anything covered so far. Oh, so if you, if you give it two arguments, then it's start and stop. If you give it one argument, it's just stop. So, so getting from six to seven? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anything, any other questions? Okay, so we'll go into the first exercise. Um, so the first exercise is um, kind of meant to just be a warm up. And so this is actually uh, a picture from uh, the, the coast of Tanzania, and there's a beach called uh, Pangani. Um, it has really wonderful sand, so if you ever make it to Tanzania, um, you should check out Zanzibar first, but after Zanzibar, you should check out Pangani. Okay, so our first exercise, um, we're just gonna be dealing um, with, with rectangles, uh, sorry, with, well, triangles, which are gonna be half of a, of a rectangle, as I'll show you later. Uh, and as I said before, with our rectangle function, uh, we had the length and the width. Um, but in this case, we want to figure out what the hypotenuse is. And the hypotenuse is just that diagonal um, that's Z. Okay. And so now what we want to do is we want to grow the rectangle. Um, is in which in case is growing the triangle, uh, and then we get a new hypotenuse. That's going to be H. And then what we want to do is we want to see um, the ratio of the original hypotenuse over the new hypotenuse. And so what you wind up um, getting is something like that. And then you can see here, so we just kind of want the ratio, so Z divided by H. So the original hypotenuse over the new one. Uh, and this is just to kind of help show you. And so essentially we're going to be making a few different functions. So one function um, is going to be calculating the ratio. So it's going to take um, a length, a width, and a growth factor. We're going to have a second function to calculate the hypotenuse. Uh, and so that function just takes in as an argument the rectangle. And then to actually calculate the hypotenuse, um, you use this equation. So you just square the length, um, square the width, sum them together, and then take the square root of that. Uh, and then you get the hypotenuse. And then this is just kind of everything that you'll be using. So I can kind of leave this up for you to reference. And so if you, let me see, I, I can go back to this. If you go here, uh, this is on GitHub, Rubano slash PyCon 17 toot. Um, you can use that um, to look at some of the code examples. So you'll have all the functions for the rectangle, um, creating the rectangle, growing the rectangle. Um, so you'll be using that you'll be using those functions um, to solve the problem. So yeah, I'll, I'll give you guys a few minutes and then I'll kind of go around in the audience. Uh, and so essentially, just to kind of restate, your goal is creating that top function. So you're gonna have something that lets you give a length, a width, and a factor, and what it returns is gonna be the ratio of the hypotenuse. So d does anyone have any questions? might be a little confusing, so just wanna. Any questions? Sure. It could be the growth factor is something that you input. Oh, oh, so, the, it, so there's a, there was a function earlier that was called grow rectangle, um, and so it just uh, multiplies. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And then this is the, the GitHub page that you can use for reference. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll kind of take a walk 
around in the audience and just kind of, um, you know, help out if, if anyone's running into problems.
Hello. So just to clarify, the, the ratio that you're calculating, it's going to be the original over the new. So some people were, were doing the kind of the, the larger over the smaller, but it's kind of like just in the picture. So the, the smaller hypotenuse over the larger hypotenuse. And that line, that horizontal line is just like a division line. So some people might be, might be getting the inverse.
Okay, we'll just wait a couple more minutes. There might be one or two more people left. Um, but yeah, just let's do about three more minutes, and then I'll go over I'll go over a solution. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and show you wh what I came up with. Uh, and so I know this is Python, but there is more than one way to do this. So this is just what, what I used. Um, so I created a, a function called git hype, uh, which is just the hypotenuse. Uh, and so what it does is, since the rectangle is a tuple, um, I'm just kind of doing a, a comprehension. So there's a, a function in Python called pow. So you give it the number, and then you give it what you want to raise it to the power of. So I'm saying pow of uh, the first one it gets is the length, so it raises that to the power of 2. Then the next item in the tuple is the width, so it raises that to the power of 2. Uh, and then we want the sum of that. So I just pass that comprehension into sum. Uh, so I'm here. So then I get the sum. So that's the sum of the squares. And then there's also a function called square root, so it, which is in the math module. And so you just call square root on that. Uh, and then next, so the ratio, sorry, the function uh, that I'm creating is get ratio. Uh, and so what you pass in is a length, a width, and a factor. Um, so first. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm using triangle and rectangle interchangeably, and some of you might be confused, but in this case, it's just a length and a width, and so it doesn't really matter. Um, but, so yeah, so rectangle, calling make, make rectangle on the length and the width. So I have the first one. Um, so grow rectangle was already defined earlier, um, so that was in, in the readme, so that function. Um, so we create another uh, rectangle called big rectangle. So we just grow the original rectangle by a factor. And what we're returning is going to be the hypotenuse of the original divided by the hypotenuse of the larger one. Uh, and so that's, that's essentially it. And then if you run it, then you should get those answers. 
Um, so let me go back here. Are, are there any questions about this? Yes. Yes, yeah, so, so the question, yeah, the question is what, what was the advantage of doing that? Uh, it's just preference. <laughs> did, did somebody say, have a comment? I didn't, I didn't. Oh, so he said, yeah. In, in this case, it's just, that's just my preference. Um, a lot of the examples on here, I uh, coded them in a way so that it would fit in the line length of the slide. So it's very well possible that the way you described, maybe it was one character too long and it caused it to go down. So, yeah. <laughs> right, I mean, yeah, I, I guess it, it depends on how much functional programming you do because since I kind of do it a lot, I kind of think in that way immediately, right? And so, yeah, I mean, but in this case, it's only, it's only, it's a tuple of two items, so it doesn't really matter, right? So I, I, I say just preference. Um, and the advantage that it would give you is if it wasn't just two, if it was five. Um, but yeah, in this case, it was just by preference. So, yeah. any other questions? So I, I, I noticed, so, um, a couple of people were using NumPy. Um, that, I agree, would be overkill. Uh, <laughs> some, some astute people may have noticed that um, there actually is a hypotenuse function in Python. Um, it's in the, st the statistics module, maybe. I don't remember exactly. Um, so that would have even saved you, you know, a whole function. You just use what's built into Python. Uh, okay. Say that again. Oh, the, the, yeah, so the question was, um, where did I define that make? Uh, so these were the kind of the original functions that were given. Um, so yeah, so the make rectangle and glow rectangle um, were kind of already defined, so I was just using those. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, now, so you might not need pandas. So one thing that I've noticed, um, I'm just working with uh, you know, different people on different projects, a lot of times they pull in um, NumPy or pandas um, to do things that you can essentially do with pure Python. Uh, and so this is just gonna show you how to do some kind of basic, uh, I guess solve some basic problems that you would normally use either NumPy or Pandas for, um, but just show you how you could do it in Python. Okay, so first is obtaining data. And so this, in this case, what we're gonna do is we just wanna take um, like a CSV file and read it into Python. Uh, in this case, I'm just gonna create like an in-memory file object, so just using um, a CSV string, uh, but you could also be reading in a CSV file as well. Uh, and so Python has a function called dickreader from the CSV module. Uh, and so you just give it uh, that file-like object. Uh, and then you could actually call, um, you don't have to call dict on this, but what it returns is an ordered dict. Um, and it doesn't look as pretty when you print it. So I just wrapped it in a dict so it would look like a familiar dictionary. Um, but that's just a really easy way to read in um, dictionaries, or sorry, to read in CSV files in Python. Okay, so next is reading JSON. And so in this case, uh, I'm gonna, I'm introducing something um, some of you might not be familiar with. So it's this here, um, it's called iJSON. Um, so if you wanna use that, it's um, pip install iJSON. And the reason that I use that is because iJSON kind of works incrementally. So if you have a JSON file, it doesn't read the whole file into memory. It only reads in as much data as you're actually consuming. 
So you can see here when I call next, it just reads in that first item. Um, so you could do this without IJSON, but it, it would wind up using um, calling in the whole file into memory. Um, so in this case, I'm um, just calling the GitHub API. So you can see the JSON URL there. Um, you get back a file-like object. And what IJSON uh, accepts, so it takes the file-like object and then that second argument. And the second argument should be a path that leads to a list um, because it's, it's assuming you have tabular data. So in this case, that GitHub um, URL, if you go there, you would get a list of users. So if the, um, essentially the, the last argument, sorry, the last word is always item. Uh, but if you have a JSON structure and the actual list of data is nested into the JSON, then you would just, instead of using item, you would just write in the path to where that data actually is. But it still is going to end with item. So it could be, you know, result.users.item. And that means that that result, that, you know, that list of users was actually nested. And so then what you wind up getting back is an iterator of those JSON items. Okay, so next, uh, this is how you would use, this is what you would use to read in um, Excel data. So Python can read CSV data natively, but it can't read Excel data natively. Um, so to read Excel data, there's a pretty neat module, uh, sorry, pretty neat package called XLRD. And the way that you use that, um, so we are using a file. Um, this is just a, tech, a test Excel file that's in the, the Meza repo. Um, so once you have that file, uh, the way that it's meant to work, it's meant to work with um, files that are kind of on disk. Um, so I'm, this might be a little new. So this URL retrieve, um, open workbook doesn't take a file-like object. It only takes a file path. So this URL retrieve is just kind of setting a file path. Um, but once you have a file path, then you get the access to the book. And then in this case, we want the first sheet in the workbook. And then once we have that sheet, then we have access to all the values in each of the rows. Um, so the first, first we just extract the header, um, which is going to be that first row of the sheet. Uh, and then we are just going to get um, a count of how many rows there are total. And so that's here. Uh, and then here, kind of going back to what I mentioned earlier, so my preference is, is for those comprehensions. Um, so we're just extracting the values of each row um, in the sheet. And then to actually get the data, um, we're just going to convert it into a dictionary. And so we have the header, and the header stays the same for every row. And then each row is going to be um, you know, those individual items of data. Uh, and then we call next on the data, and then we get back the dictionary. And then the reason you see this here, um, I believe in the test data, there's, it started out with either like a blank row or a blank column or something. Um, so that's why you kind of see that blank blank. Um, one thing to point out, so since it's Excel, Excel has formatted data. Uh, so this, you can see some date. So internally, Excel stores dates um, as floats or might be integers, I'm not sure exactly, but it, it stores the dates as a number. Um, you, you would have to do a little bit more um, kind of uh, background work to actually convert these into the, the equivalent. Um, so XLRD actually knows the data types for each cell value. And so you can kind of use what it knows to convert um, numbers and dates and um, different items. Um, but this is just showing you how to get the raw data. Okay, transform it. So here we're gonna um, just do some some grouping. Uh, so first, and and just to kind of make it clear, in in all of these cases we're dealing with iterators of dictionary, uh, and so just to keep the data structure kind of the same throughout all the examples. Um, so this is just another um, way of of recording it, and so I I like to call them records. 
Um, so we just have, you can think of this of records as just like a table, essentially. Uh, so in this case, we want to group the records by amount. Uh, and then in Python, there's a function called item getter. Um, so we use that here. So what item getter does is it takes a field name, which is amount, um, and what it returns back is a function. And so this function will take a dictionary and then it returns the value of that amount. So that might be a little confusing for those who, who haven't come across that before. Um, but basically what that lets us do is it lets us sort a list of dictionaries by a given field. Uh, and so the way that um, group by works, you have to sort the data before you group it. And so the key func is passed into both the sort function and the group by function. So we sort the, we sort the records, we get sorted, we pass that sorted list into group by, and then we get back the groups. And then once you have the groups, um, what it actually returns is a tuple. So each group is a tuple. So the first item is the key. Uh, and so in this case, um, we were grouping by amount. So the key is going to be each unique amount. Um, and then the G is going to be an iterator of each item in that group. So since an, it's an iterator, you see here, so I'm calling list on the G to actually say return a list. Uh, and then when we get, we call next, so we get the first group. So all, all items that had an amount of 200 are shown there. Okay, and so now we're going to be doing something, um, I guess, a, a little similar. So instead of grouping, we want to aggregate. Uh, so in this case, we just want to take all of the records and we want to sum the amount of all of them. Uh, and so this is, this is kind of some neat syntax that was introduced. Um, I forget if it was 3.5 or which one, but in one of the, the recent uh, Python 3 versions. Uh, so first we take, um, we take the first item of records, uh, and then what we want to do is we want to create a new dictionary, um, and we're replacing the key, which is amount, because we're aggregating by amount, and then the value is the sum of all of the amounts. So essentially what that does is it returns the first item of that records and all of its keys, and it's replacing the one that we're aggregating by with the total. So let me stop there for a second. Does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, so next we're going to go over storing data. Okay, so just like the dick reader, Python has a dick writer. Uh, and so in this case, we just want to write um, two rows, so again, we're calling it records. Um, with the dick writer, you, you have to specify the header. Uh, and so in this case, I'm assuming every item in the records ha have the, the, same, the same fields. Um, otherwise, if one of the records has a field um, that wasn't in that header list, it won't be present in the, re in, in the result. Um, but once you have the headers, then you just set the file that you want to save to, uh, and then you write the header, and then you use write rows um, to write all of the rows, and then you get your CSV file. Okay. So up until um, now, most of that was, was pure Python. Um, so now I'm going to um, show you how you do a few of these things with Meza. Um, so Meza is a library that I wrote, and it is, is kind of intended to be used for doing data analysis. You can kind of think of it as a, a lightweight version of Pandas. Um, so I tried to cover a lot of the use cases that um, people use Pandas for. Uh, but in this case, Meza is pure Python, um, so there are no compiled C libraries. Um, you, you don't need Anaconda to install it. It's, um, you, know, you just use pip uh, and installs, and it's, it's kind of simple. Um, and 
It also uses functional programming under the hood. So a lot of the things you do with pandas are more object-oriented. So you have a pandas data frame, and then you call methods of that data frame. Whereas with Meza, it exposes functions, and then you give it records, which then output um, kind of a new set of records. And so this is also on GitHub as well. Um, it's all under, under my Rubano. OK. So we'll just go over those same examples. Um, but now I'll show you how you, you would do that with uh, using Meza. So when you're reading data, there's, a, there's, an, there's an IO module. Uh, and there's a function called read. So the way read works is it looks at the file name. And based on the extension, it determines if it's a CSV or JSON or XML, et cetera. Um, so in this case, we just pass it the file name, and then we get back records. Um, you can also pass it a file-like object. If you pass it a file-like object, then you have to be explicit and tell it um, if it's a CSV or JSON. Um, but in this case, it's a file name, so it knows it's CSV. You call next, and then you kind of get, get your records. Uh, here, we're going to be using the, uh, the GitHub API that I, that I showed you earlier. Uh, so in this case, you can see here we're passing the file-like object. So you pass the file-like object. In this case, we just use read JSON. Uh, and it uses that, that iJSON under the hood um, that I mentioned earlier. So you can see in this line, I'm passing in the path, and I'm just saying item. So that means that the, the JSON that it's getting is the, the complete list. And then you call next, and then you get the records. And then finally, XLS. Uh, so this is um, the same Excel file that was mentioned earlier. Uh, but in this case, under the hood, um, I parsed the date. Um, so instead of kind of that number, you, you actually get what the date is. And it also recognized that there was an empty row and empty column. So it kind of stripped that out automatically as well. Okay, so now for doing aggregations, uh, there's a, a function called aggregate. Uh, and this is doing the same thing that I did earlier. Um, so you have the aggregate function. You give it the records. You tell it what you want to aggregate by. So we're aggregating by amount. And then you tell it what you want to do. So in this case, we are summing. And so you get back. So in this case, since aggregate combines everything into one dictionary, you're not calling next, because the result the, the, the result isn't an iterator. It's just the one dictionary. So it just summed the amount of, of all those records. And this is an interesting function. So this is merge. Uh, and so you give it uh, your records. And what it does is it kind of applies each record one after the other. Um, so if any of these keys overlapped, the, re the last item um, that was in that, in that list would actually overwrite it. So in this case, since none of the keys overlap, um, you just wind up getting one dictionary that kind of has the result of all those together. And then with the grouping example, uh, kind of a using it a similar way. So there's the function group. Um, and so you pass in the records and what you want to group by. So you can see here we're, we're grouping by item. And then, yeah. I do not believe so. Um, and I actually forgot to paste the result, but the result, the, the result of this would be similar to, to the previous group by example. Um, but I just wanted to point out here, uh, so you don't have to worry about sorting um, because this group function will take care of doing the sorting for you. Uh, so how many people here have used pivot tables in Excel? Okay, about half. Um, so this uh, is, so with Meza, I, I have two functions. Um, one is called pivot, and the other is called normalize. 
um, but they essentially work um, the way that Excel pivot tables work. Uh, so in this case, I'll show you a bit how you'd use normalize. Uh, so if you have records here, uh, and in this case, you can see that you have um, Satosa and Versi um, as field names, and what we want to do is normalize that so it's kind of more tabular. And so in this case, the arguments that we want to give it, um, so I'll kind of first go here. So the key data, um, we know that Satosa and Versi are, are pedal links, and so we're going to rename that to length. Um, and then what Satosa and Versi, what those names actually are, are the species. So the column is going to be species. Uh, and then the rows that it's getting this information from is here, is going to be Satosa and Versi. And so when we call normalize, now we have kind of a nice, you know, normalized tabular data set. So the color is blue, length is five, species is Satosa. And just to kind of show you visually what happened, so this was the data before, and then we called normalize on the data, and then you kind of get what you see in that second table. Now for storing data, um, Mesa has two functions. So um, one, or I should say two modules. So one module is the convert module, and it has functions for converting records into different um, types, so CSV, um, JSON, GeoJSON, et cetera. Uh, then there's also a write function, which will take the converted data and persist it to disk. So what you get back here using the convert functions, this CSV is a file-like object. And then when you want to persist it to disk, you pass it to write, and you just give it the file name. And then for JSON, it's similar. So instead of records to CSV, it's records to JSON. And then we just write out the JSON. OK, so now we're going to get into the next exercise. So this picture is also uh, from Tanzania. Um, this is Mount Meru, uh, which is um, fairly close to, to where I am in Arusha. OK, so for the problem, um, we want to create um, a list of dicks, which is records, like I talked bef mentioned before. Um, the keys of each dictionary are going to be factor, length, width, and ratio. Uh, and the factors are going to start at 1 and then go up to 20. And this is just kind of showing you, this is an example of what it would look like. So you can see, um, you know, the factor increases one, two, three. Um, the length and width, um, those can be set to anything, um, but they're, they should be consistent um, in, in each item. And then you can see there's a ratio for each one. So then what we want to do is we want to group the records um, by quartiles of, of the ratio value. And then within each group, we're going to aggregate by the median. And so this is kind of showing you what I mean by that. So to get the quartile, um, uh, you can just do this. So, so once you get the ratio, uh, so that operator is, is called floor division. So you're just going to do floor division um, by 2.5, and then you'll get back uh, a number um, between 0 and 4. And so that's essentially what you're going to be using to group. And then in the two functions that you're going to use, so in statistics, there's a median function, and then Meza has the group function. And so once you have the records, um, just write out the records to a CSV file. And so you're going to wind up getting four records, because um, there's going to be four groups. Uh, and so you're going to have one item per group. And the functions you're going to use for that, I kind of talked about those earlier. So records to CSV will convert it to CSV. And then write will actually write it to disk. And this is an example 
of the first two records for what they would be. So the key and then the median of the ratio within the group. Okay, does anyone have any questions? It's, it's a little more complex, um, but it, it builds up on the previous problem. So you're going to be using a lot of the same functions. Um, so the question was randomly generating. So it's so the, the number for length and width um, is up to you. So it could be random like initially, but it should be the same. It should be the same for each one. So what's, what's changing in each record is the factor, right? So the factor starts out as one, and then it's two, and then it's three. Right, the factor is just a range, and the, and the ratio is um, using the same function from the previous problem. So the ratio, um, okay, yeah. And then the length and width can be anything, um, but they just should just be the same for each item. It, it shouldn't change. Okay. Any questions? Other questions? And if you look in the in the GitHub repo, um, there's a section called Problem Two, so it lists all of those statements. And also what I'm going to do, I just realized this, I'm going to add in the solutions from, from exercise one um, to the README. So in case you didn't get a working answer, um, you'll just be able to, to use what I, what I put up on the README.
Okay, so if you refresh the README, um, you'll see here there's an exercise one solution. So you can use that.
Okay, just to make a, a clarification, so I was told that it is technically not a quartile um, <laughs> that it's grouping by. Uh, so th this line here, so I called it a, a quartile, but essentially all it's meant to do is say everything from 0 to 0.25 is in one group, 0.25 to 0.5 is another group, 0.5 to 0.75, and then 0.75 to 1. And if you just do this operation, this floor division by 0.25, that will give you um, the key. So it's going to be 0, like 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, or 2, or 3. So just to clarify.
Okay, we'll go f about five more minutes. Okay, I'll just show you uh, the, the answer that I came up with. And like I mentioned before, there's, there's of course, multiple ways to do this. Um, so, yeah, so yours might not look exactly like this. Uh, so just to start off, um, like I said, the length and width, um, it doesn't matter what it is, um, uh, as long as it's the same um, consistent within each record. So in this case, I just made it a square, so I set length and width equal to two. And then for the records, I did a list comprehension um, so length width uh, are, the s are set above. Um, ratio, I'm calling the get ratio function that, that we mentioned earlier. And then I'm looping um, through the range from, from one, essentially from one to 20. And so that's where you get that F. Um, so F is, F and ratio are, are the things that are changing. 
And next, I'm going to use the, the median function. Uh, and then from Meza, I'm going to use um, the group function from the process module. So one thing that, that I didn't mention, um, I know at least one person figured it out on his own, um, but group can actually take an aggregator um, uh, keyword argument. So you can either use the individual aggregator function or you can just use an aggregator into the group function. Uh, so in this case, I defined my aggregator here. So the aggregator takes a group. Um, and the, the advantage of defining the aggregator um, keyword argument within the group, or within, within, within here, is because the, the aggregator um, doesn't have to worry about the key, the key right? So what we get here is just the, is just the iterator um, of records. Um, so we don't have to do any um, like tuple dereferencing to, to strip out the key or anything. That's already taken care of. Uh, so here, this is just uh, another comprehension. So I'm getting an iterator of the ratios. So we get the ratio for each item in the group, and I'm returning the median of the ratio. So th this is our aggregator function. We pass that as a keyword argument. So that's here. Um, this line is how we're grouping things. Uh, so kind of, I think most of you got this, hopefully. Um, so the, what we're grouping by is, and I'm, like I said, uh, it's, I called it the quartile, but I've been told it's not a quartile, but whatever the, the correct terminology is, um, we're just doing the floor division by 0.25, so that's how we're grouping it. Uh, and so now when we call this group function, we pass the records the key function that we're grouping by, and then in this case, I'm passing in an, an aggregator function. And so now, um, we just have to write everything out. So the reason that the aggregator function doesn't need the key is because the key is given in the groups. So now we have the key that's back again, um, we're just doing another list comprehension. So essentially for key, um, and here this uh, G is what was returned by the aggregator, aggregator function, right? So in this case, it's just the median. So it's a you know, basic comprehension. So now we have a list of dictionaries, and we can pass that into records to CSV. We get our CSV file-like object, and then we just write that out. And so once you write it out, then you just get something like that. So the keys uh, and then the medians. Okay. So let me go back to these. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, so before we do part three, let's just do a um, 10 minute break. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. This, is this the slide you want? <coughs> I will, yeah.
So some people have asked for the solutions. Um, I added that to the, the README. So you can see here, so exercise two solution is now there. Um, so if anybody wants to, to take like a closer look, you can do that. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and jump into the next part. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce um, RICO. So RICO is, um, you can think of it as kind of uh, the, the next step up from Meza. Um, Meza is primarily dealing with data processing, um, data analysis whereas RICO is geared for stream processing. Um, so one of the differences is that RICO uh, is designed to read URLs. So for, for Meza, if you have a web resource, you have to use URL open to pass Meza a, a file-like object, whereas RICO is designed to work with URLs directly. Um, another one of the differences is that RICO is designed to read um, I guess primarily it's designed to read RSS feeds. Um, so you can read in RSS, um, JSON feeds, raw, raw XML, um, HTML. Uh, so it's, it's kind of designed for doing a lot of web-based web um, ETL or, or web-based stream processing. So how, how many people here have heard of Yahoo Pipes? Okay few of you. So essentially, Rico was created to implement Yahoo Pipes in Python. Um, so if, if you have used Yahoo Pipes, then a lot of this will look really familiar. And for those who don't know Yahoo Pipes, Yahoo Pipes uh, was a web service that let you do ETL on RSS feeds. Um, that's kind of the gist of it. So they had individual modules they called pipes and each pipe let you do either, it could either be a source pipe or a transformation pipe, but it just kind of let you mix and match RSS feeds, do kind of cool transformations, mashups, um, and it was pretty, pretty cool, and then they shut it down um, a couple years ago. So for this, um, you just pip install Rico, and Kind of like before, I'm kind of gonna go over the same, the same, I guess, be basic uh, type of task you'll be doing. So first, obtaining data. For this, um, I just wanted to show you how you could do some basic screen scraping. So if you go onto the python.org um, website on the events page, um, you see the Python events calendar, uh, and this is just a, a quick screenshot. But what we want to do is kind of extract the, the upcoming events from the website. And if, you, if you're in Chrome and you have the inspector, um, you can kind of highlight the, that main list. And so you can see where in the DOM that is. And so we're going to be using that information later um, because the, the pipe that we're, we're using to, to read the the HTML, it's going to take an, an XPath. And so XPath just tells, it just tells you where within the DOM your data is, is located. Um, so HTML pages, they start with HTML, and then you have um, body, and then you could have any number of tags. And so within the Chrome inspector, if you kind of highlight the area you want, there's an option that says copy XPath. And so you can use that to kind of get a start to figure out what, what the X path is actually going to be. And so here, uh, the way we're going to instantiate it is there's a collections module. Uh, and within that module, we're going to use sync pipe. And sync pipe, you can just think of it as a way of creating, um, like a, it, it creates a chainable interface. So whereas before with, with Meza, we were calling the functions um, kind of independently. When you have a sync pipe, uh, you can use a function, um, but it, it looks kind of like a method. So you would actually put a, a dot and then the name of the function. So it, it acts like a, 
or I should say looks like a method, but under the hood it's actually acting like a function. So all of the pipes are individual functions, um, but it's just a convenient way so that you can access you can access them using dot notation, so you don't have to import every module or every pipe that you want to use. Um, so in this case, we start out with the URL. Um, so that was a screenshot that I showed you earlier. It's just from the python.org events page. Uh, and then next is the XPath. So in this case, it's a, it's a bit long, uh, but you can see, like I said, it starts with HTML. Um, so you essentially just figure out exactly where within the DOM the data is. Uh, and in this case, you want um, the, that list of events. So that's going to be the, the, the actual X path. Um, next here is going to be the configuration. So for the configuration, we give it the URL and the X path. Um, and so these are going to be what we use initially. Um, these lines here, so this is going to be um, for the subsequent pipes that we access um, using the dot notation. Uh, and so it might actually help if I go to the next slide first so you can see what, what we're doing. So for Rico, the, what I kind of like to call the result of using sync pipe um, is a flow. Um, and basically, everything um, that you see here kind of outputs a flow. So if I just stopped at this first line, this sync pipe, it would still be a flow. And all that means is you get this nice dot notation. So anything that's a flow, you just use dot, and then any module that's defined within Rico you have access to. So here we want to say, we want to figure out how we want to access the data. Um, if it's an RSS feed, you would just use the default, which is fetch. Since in this case, it's HTML, we're using, and we want to access an XPath within the HTML, then it's XPath fetch page. And then we pass in the configuration. So what we're doing after that um, is the sub element. And let me just go back so now I can show you what we wanted to do. So within the sub element, um, we have these two uh, these two parameters. Uh, and so the main one is this one is, is EPath, and this stands for the event, and then LPath, which stands for the, the location. So within, um, I guess, the HTML, once you get that actual list of, of, of events, each event itself is then further broken down. So the path to the actual event name is going to be here. The path to the location, the name of the location, is here. And so you can see how we use that here. So we pass in the event path, and we assign it to the field event. Uh, and this one, we're passing in the location path and we assign it to the field location. And then what I'm doing here, this rename, so I'll go back. So this is essentially just used to make the output a little prettier. Um, rename takes a field, and then it takes a, a, second, um, a second item, um, which is what you want to rename it to. In this case, if you don't pass that one, it will just delete it. So this is just a convenient way to delete these two fields um, because it just makes the output very verbose. So in that last line, we're just removing those two fields that we don't want, and we're going to end up with the fields we do want, um, which is just the event and location. And Every flow has a couple methods. So one is list, which will return a list of all the items, and the other is output. And in this case, we're using output, so it returns the generator of the items. And it's the same data structure that we've been using before, um, just an iterator of dictionary. So you call next on the stream, 
and then you get the first event. You call next again, and then you get the next event. Okay, so now we're gonna do a little bit of transformation. So in this case, um, what we wanna do is we wanna find the path to the date for the event, and we want to filter by all events that occur after June 1st. Um, so here we just have the filter rule. So it takes the field that we're looking for, which is a date, the operation is after, and value, which is the date that it has to be after. Um, the flow is the same as before. Um, sub element, sub element, rename, those are the same as before. So the only thing that's different is at the end, we're adding in that filter. So this time, oh, actually, and I forgot to mention, so yeah, I added, I added that extra date. So there was that date path, and then I added, so you can't do a filter on a field that doesn't exist. So I added in that date field. Um, so then we can filter on it. So now we have the date field, which is there. Event and location were this already there, same as before. Um, but in this case, it filters um, to only the event that met the criteria. And so next, so Rico has a few different APIs. So the one that I just showed you was the synchronous API. So Rico also has uh, an asynchronous API, which uses Twisted under the hood, um, and it has a parallel processing API. Uh, and even within parallel processing, you can um, parallelize either by threads um, or by um, the physical CPUs. Uh, so in this case, since we're gonna be making web requests, we're gonna, we're gonna parallel, uh, parallelize by threads. Uh, so if if you went to that to that website, the the events has kind of two sections. So the section that we were were kind of scraping from was the upcoming events. Below that, there was a section that was previous events. So in this case, we want to get items from both the current or the upcoming events and the previous events, um, just using the kind of one uh, you know one one call, I guess. Uh, and this time, instead of calling sync pipe, um, we're going to be calling sync collection. Um, it's still an X path. Uh, the only difference is now we have two X paths, so one for each section that we want to pull from. And th what sync collection takes is going to be the sources. And so it's just going to be the configuration uh, for each of the individual calls to this X path fetch path fetch page. So, and I didn't, I, I think I may have mentioned merge before, but merge is from Meza, so basically it's just taking this dictionary, um, which is the same for both sources, and it's adding in the XPath, because XPath is the only thing that changes um, within that. So we have the sources set. Uh, so what you want to do the main difference is to make it parallel, you just pass parallel equals true to sync collection. So if you didn't pass parallel equals true, then it's gonna do it sequentially. Uh, and in order to get that flow back that we mentioned, um, so this collection object, you just call the pipe method. And when you call that pipe method, you get back a flow, which is the same type of thing that we were working with before. So now we can call it the the, use the dot notation. So we can take the sub element, uh, and in this case, um, I was just extracting the event, um, and we're using the same rename rule as before, um, just to make the output kind of fit on the slide. And like I mentioned before, you can use um, dot output or dot list. So in this case, I'm showing you how you use dot list. So you uh, call dot list, and now stream is a list. So if you take the first item of the list, um, then you get the first event. And the main difference is now this time stream has items from both of those sections. So both the, the upcoming events and the previous events. 
And so this is just um, calling the last event in the stream. Uh, and you see it was Pi Days Vienna. Okay, so before I get to the exercise, so any, any questions about, about any of that? Any questions? Okay. So exercise three, this is the last exercise. Um, so this is Mount Kilimanjaro, um, also in Tanzania. So it's the, the largest mountain in Africa. Uh, and so I guess that should kind of give you a clue about the difficulty of, of the exercise. Okay, so for this, uh, Python also has an RSS feed um, for, it's like a job board. Uh, so what we want to do is fetch the jobs from the RSS feed. Um, one of the bad things about the feed is the, the data isn't, th there's not a lot of metadata. Um, it's just kind of all grouped into the summary. Um, but it's, it has new lines, um, which we can use to figure out different parts of, of the summary. So you want to tokenize the summary by the new line. Uh, and when you do that, um, each summary starts out with the lo where the job is located. Um, so the first token um, that is a result of that tokenize is going to be the location. So we want to use the sub-element pipe to get to figure out what the location is for each job. And then once we have each job, to filter the jobs, to filter for jobs that are located within the US. And so this is going to be what you use. So you're going to use the sync pipe, um, kind of which I, which I talked about. And then the URL for the feed is listed there. And then the, the individual pipes that you're going to use to kind of solve this. Um, so you're going to use fetch, which is the source pipe, um, tokenizer, sub-element, and filter pipes. And then once you kind of have that, the next goal is to write um, the link location and title um, for each item into a JSON file. And so to do that, there's a, a few functions you're going to use. So for Meza, um, there's a, a function called dfilter. Uh, what dfilter does is it's kind of, it's kind of like a, a way to you pass it a dictionary and you tell it the fields that you want to either keep or remove, and it returns a new dictionary with those fields either um, removed or, or kept. Uh, records to JSON, uh, and then for Meza, you're going to use write. So, so you'll find that here. Uh, and also, what may help, uh, if you go to, to the Rico GitHub, um, there's a folder called modules. Um, and within that folder, each pipe is its own file. Um, and so that will give you, uh, that will show you kind of examples for using each of those different pipes. Uh, and, and also, as before, the, the examples that I showed in the slides um, are on the GitHub page as well. So you can kind of start here. And then if you want more examples using the pipes, then the, the, the Rico GitHub page will have those examples. Any questions?
sure. Sure, sure. So the question was about the flow and the same part. So when you call, so you could call um, that sync pipeline, you could call that on its own. What it returns is a pipe object. And a pipe object has the, uh, the dot notation. So I'm essentially calling that pipe object flow. So anytime you call uh, a, a pipe, it returns another pipe object. So you can chain as many different pipes as you want. Oh, yeah, yeah. The parentheses is just so I could do it on multiple lines. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so for pipe notation, in order to make it pretty, and it would actually be prettier if, it was, if this wasn't a slide, because each, pipe, each dot would just be one line, um, but it just makes it look cleaner because the pipes, the dots are under each other instead of having to put the dots all in one line. Does that answer the question? Okay, yeah. Any other questions? So are you still have bounce on?
So for, for those who want the documentation, um, here, this is the link um, for the GitHub. So GitHub slash Nerevu slash Rico. And then the folder is Rico modules. And then if you just click on any of the modules, so I'll, I'll click on the tokenize for you. So if you click on the module, uh, then you'll see the, the documentation um, along with some examples. Um, so the, the sub element, I think you, you ha have an example in that, that readme, but the tokenizer, um, you, can, you can just find that on the, the Rico GitHub. So I'll, I'll leave this up here in case, case you want to see that.
Okay, I'll, I'll give you guys a, f a few more minutes. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm just going to go over the solution, uh, and then there will be a few more uh, minutes for questions. So here, uh, we're just going to use the sync pipe. Um, the URL is the one that I gave you before. It's just that RSS feed. Um, the configuration is a bit simpler. Um, it's the fetch configuration is just the URL. Um, tconf is, is for the tokenizer. So for the tokenizer, it takes a delimiter. The default delimiter is a comma. And so in this case, we want to delimit by a new line. Um, so if you don't need to change the delimiter, you can leave that line out. But in this case, we want the new line. Uh, the, there's going to be two rules that we want to use. Um, so for the rule, um, the field is going to be in the location field. The operation is contains. Um, and the two values that we want it to contain are USA and United States. And like I said before, the, the, the actual syntax here might look a little weird, but I just did what I could to make it fit on the slide. So you wouldn't necessarily write it exactly like this in, in your file. Um, but what we want to end up with is just a list of dictionaries. So each dictionary is going to be a rule. And so the first rule is that location contains USA. The second rule is that the location contains United States. And so we do that, and we get here a list of, a list of those dictionary rules. OK. So next, um, since we have two rules uh, here at the top, we, we have to tell it how to use the rules. So by default, um, it uses an AND. So for the filter, if you supply multiple rules, it will think it will assume that every rule has to match. In this case, we want or. So we just use the combine, um, the combine keyword, and we say it's or. And then for, see, quarks is for the sub element. So for for sub element, um, this is what we're going to be passing into it. Um, so there's two things to note here. So emit is going to be false. If emit was true, then it would essentially 
erase everything that was that you fetched and would replace it um, with with what you were subselecting. So when you say emit is false, it essentially saves your work. It doesn't erase everything. Um, and then token key, uh, by default, token key um, is going to be uh, is going to be content. And so in this case, we're just saying that we don't want a token key. And then for path, the path in the sub element. So what what we were, what we did with tokenizer, and I'll show you later. Um, so for tokenizer, there's an option to tell it what field to assign the value in or the result in. By default, you, it assigns it to the name of the pipe. So by default, you would have a new field called tokenizer, and the result would be there. Uh, and in our case, um, we, we are going to say assign it to the field location. So that way, when we do the sub element, we can just look in location. Um, so we're looking in location. Um, and then, like I said before, you have, since you're tokenizing by new line, you have a list of um, where each item is aligned, and the location was the first line. So it looks in location, um, the, it's keyed by content, and then it's going to be the first item in that line. So that's how you get the path. And then this R rule is kind of just like before. This isn't necessary, um, but I just did this to make the output fit on the screen. So this is just going to remove these items um, from, from the output. Okay, so a lot of this should look familiar. Um, so to sync pipe, we're just passing fetch. Um, then we give it the configuration. So from here, um, this is tokenizer. So we pass in the configuration. The field that it's looking in is going to be summary. The field we're assigning it to is location. So now you want the sub element. Um, the path, I told you before, it looks in location.content.0 and we're reassigning it back to location. Uh, and then next, we're going to filter. Um, so we're just filtering where the USA or, or United States is, is in the location. Um, and then rename is just going to delete a few fields. And so here, we can just get a, a stream by calling list. And if we look at the first item in the stream, a lot of this stuff you can just ignore. It just kind of comes to default in the RSS stream. Um, but the key ones that we're going to look at, so here, um, it assigned the location. Um, this is the title, which was already there. Um, and then the link. So those are the three, the three ones that we, that we wanted to keep. And so now that we have the records, um, we just need to filter by the fields that we want to keep. Um, so here is the defilter function that I kind of told you about. So the fields we're keeping are link, location, and title. Uh, and we just do a list comprehension. Um, so by default, defilter takes these fields as a blacklist. So normally, it would delete these fields. In this case, we say inverse is true, and then it treats this as the whitelist. So these are the whitelisted keys. Um, it's a list comprehension, so we go through each item in the stream, pass it through dfilter, it keeps these fields, and assign that to records. And then once we have the records, then we can just write out to a JSON file. And then if you look at the JSON file, then you just get something like that. So we have five more minutes, so any questions? What what parts did people get stuck on? <laughs> mhm. Mm okay. Oh yeah, yeah. So the question is, how, how do you figure out all of that stuff? Uh, 
So So this is the, the RSS feed. Um, Say, oh no, no, yeah, so the, so the thing is, um, Rico uses feed parser under the hood and it reassigns description to summary. Um, so basically what I did is, when I look at the RSS feed, um, I could see that everything was kind of in a chunk. Um, and if you just do the sync pipe without any of the filters, you can just look at what it gives you raw. So before you even apply subfilter tokenizer, um, you just have the sync pipe and you just save it as as a flow, and then you can look at the output and see, okay, you know what what am I working with, and then you can kind of see everything that it has. So I guess that's the first step, uh, and then after that, it's just looking to see, okay, well where is the location, um, and then in this case, I saw that okay, well it's in the description, which, which got renamed to summary. And then if you actually print it on your terminal, you'll see all the new lines. So then I thought, okay, well, how do I get the, the location? Well, it has new lines, so let me split it by new lines. And then since it's the first item in those lines, then you can kind of work your way that way. And, and also with the configuration, you can play with the path. So you just give it, instead of giving it you know, location, content, zero, you just give it location and then see what you get back. And then you can just keep adding more and more to the path until you get the, the answer that you want. So you can do some by trial and error. You can do some, um, there's some examples in the, in the GitHub repo where you can find a s something that was similar, um, even for myself, because I wrote the documentation, you know, maybe a year ago. So I would just look through the examples and see which example was similar. So does that answer the question? Okay. Oh, feed, uh, feed parser. Yeah, so it's just a Python, um, just a, you know, a, I think it's like one of the standard libraries that people use for, for parsing RSS. So. Any other questions? Okay, all right, well thanks for coming, uh, and I'll be here. I also, I have stickers, I have laptop stickers, so if anybody wants a laptop sticker, uh, you can come, <laughs> come up to the front. But thank you.